uh, today in our section, Alan, Professor Alan Logan from Harriet Watt University, Scotland. Uh, he will tell uh, us about the conjugacy problem for accenting H and N extensions of free groups. Please, Professor. Yeah. Hello, can you can you see and hear me? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, okay, great. Uh, yeah, so I want to talk about, yeah, the context of problem for ascending H and extensions of free groups. Um, so I guess because you've made it here, you uh, hopefully know what a free group is. Um, they're the free groups and the free objects in the category of groups. Um, so um, what I want to talk about are things called ascending H and extensions. So these are a class of groups which are defined using end, uh, monomorphisms of free groups. So um, if we take a free group, and for me, my free groups are always going to be of finite rank, so finitely generated free groups. Um, and I'm going to think about endomorphisms, or rather monomorphisms of, of free groups, um, because these two pieces of data, the free group and the monomorphism, are going to define the groups I care about uh, later in the talk. So we're going to start by considering monomorphisms. And um, so we we're going to consider monomorphisms and we can ask certain questions about monomorphisms. Um, and these are going to help us later in the talk. So the first question we can ask about a monomorphism is we could consider things called its fixed subgroup. So these are the points um, in your free group which are fixed by the monomorphism. So fix of phi is the set of points x contained in x such that phi of x equals x. So these were cons um, these were studied really intensively in the 1980s. Um, so the the first question and the main question was about finite generation or fixed subgroups of automorphisms finitely generated. And there was a paper of of Besvina and Handel, and um, where they proved not only that it was finitely generated, but they proved that its rank was bounded above by the rank of the ambient free group. Um, so you should think about rank as being a complexity of the free group. So small rank means um, less complex. So what this means is that fixed subgroups are, are no more complex than the, the rank of the group um, that, they, that they live in. Um, okay, so I um, the conjugacy problem is the problem that I want to think about. And this is an algorithmic problem. So I want a sort of an algorithmic version of, of this theorem. And this is a much more recent result of Bogopolsky and Maslakova. Um, so there exists an algorithm to compute to compute a basis of this subgroup. Um, so a basis is just a minimal, a generating set of minimal cardinality. Um, okay, but I care about um, monomorphisms and these two results are both about automorphisms. So um, what I want to talk about for the um, at the start of the talk is how we can take a problem about monomorphisms and reduce it to one about automorphisms. Um, and so I'll explain how we would prove the monomorphic analog of both of these two theorems. Um, so let's start with the theorem of Besvina and Handel. So the analog here is due to Emmerich and Turner. Um, there's only there's two main differences here. The first one is that it's about endomorphisms rather than automorphisms. And the other difference is um, the date. Um, this is before, this is, um, let's say, before 1992. And um, so it predates the Bethina Handel paper by a couple of years, but that's just because of, you know, publication times um, and so on. Um, the, and the paper of Emmerich and Turner is only two pages long. It's a really, a really beautiful and really easy paper. Um, whereas the paper of Bethina and Handel is, is much more complicated um, but the tools that Bethina and Handel introduced are really important, um, which I feel I should mention. Um, it was a really landmark paper. Um, yeah, so how would you prove the result for endomorphisms using the result for automorphisms? Um, so suppose we've got uh, an endomorphism, um, or let's just say a monomorphism for the moment, um, and it's non-subjective, so it's not an automorphism. Because it's not an, an automorphism, you get this chain of subgroups. So we get f, and then we apply phi to it. So we get phi of f. And then you apply phi to that again, 
So you get phi squared of f, phi cubed of f, and phi to the 4 of f, and so on. You get this chain of subgroups. And then you can take the intersection. So this is the intersection. Um, so phi to the infinity of f is the intersection. And it's got a name. It's called the stable, the stable image um, of phi. So this is this stable image is is a subgroup of um, of your free group, and it's got um, three important properties. Um, the first one um, is that it's got rank. Um, wait, no, I should I should. Um, so our what we're going to have is a, a chain of of less than or equal to signs. So we're going to have rank of fix of phi at the left, and then we're going to have rank of f at the right and we're going to connect them with a whole bunch of less than or equal to signs and that's going to prove our prove our theorem and um, so the first one is um is this statement one so rank of this stable image is less than or equal to rank of f and um, this is um, I guess this is this follows from an old result of Takahashi from the 1950s, so it's it's quite classical. Um, it's also an uh, it's also an exercise in a in a book. Um, so Emerson Turner actually cite the exercise in the book, um, of Magnus Grass and Salatar rather than the original result of Takahashi. Um, so, um, yeah. So this subgroup, this stable image, is a is a subgroup of of bounded rank. The second fact is that phi acts as an automorphism. Um, on fine on this stable image. So if I was to write this statement out properly, it would be that phi restricted to our stable image is an automorphism of the stable image. But what that means is the rank of our fixed subgroup. So rank of fix of um, by infinity of f is less than or equal to um, the rank of, of the whole group. So this is via um, 2 and um, Bespina and Handel. And then the third point is that um, the two fixed subgroups are in fact the same. Um, and yeah, so each of these three statements are, they're not too hard to prove if you've got pencil and paper and you sit down and, and um, give yourself half an hour. Um, but the point really is that we've reduced a problem about endomorphisms to one about, about monomorphisms. Um, sorry, problem about monomorphisms to one about automorphisms. Um, yeah, so this, um, this idea of the stable image um, became quite prevalent in understanding um, monomorphisms. But it it's um it has some sort of um it's not really powerful enough to understand um them in, in, in it doesn't give us enough. It doesn't give us what we want. So if I go back a slide, what I really wanted was to understand this this theorem of Bokopolsky and Malastakova. And this argument of Emmerich, Emmerich and Turner isn't isn't good enough. It doesn't tell us enough. Um so more recently, um so um, a, someone called um, Mutanguha, Jean-Pierre Mutanguha, who's doing a postdoc in Princeton just now, came up with the idea of an automorphic expansion. So this is a topological view of, a, of an endomorphism. And this gives us that extra power to prove the analog of, um, of the Bogopolsky mazakova theorem and other things that we need um, in this context. So this is a much more systematic way of viewing, um, of viewing endomorphisms of free groups. And it gives us much more powerful tools. Um, but it's 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 topological in nature. I hope that it's, the fact that it's topological in nature doesn't scare you. And um, I know this is an algebra conference, but the topology we're talking about are um, fundamental groups of graphs, which are free groups. Um, so it's it's not too scary, hopefully. Um, okay, so here we've got a um, a monomorphism of a free group. So our free group is the free group over A, B, C, and D, and I'm defining it by A maps to A, B, A inverse, and B maps to B, A, B inverse. These two 
um, these are really the same. Um, you're just swapping A and B around. And this third one is just ever so slightly different because um, this is a C, A, C inverse. So you're taking the C. Um, so this is, yeah, C, A, C inverse is slightly different from the first two. Um, and then B maps to B squared. Okay, so what I want to do is view the free group as a graph. Um, so I mentioned that um, graphs have fundamental groups which are free groups. So we can um, exploit this association. Um, so here I've got a graph which has got um, four loops in it. So its fundamental group will be the free group of rank four. And um, I'm going to, um, so here I've written a key. I'm going to think of the, the basis element A as being this loop here. So we first do we first do L and then we do this loop alpha and then we do L in reverse. And um, similarly, B is corresponding to the sort of the right hand loop. So first do R, then you do beta and then you do R in reverse. And then C is corresponding to the upways loop. So we first do U, then gamma and then U in reverse. And then D corresponds to M. Um, okay, this graph is just it's colored. I've um I've got red loops and then I've got some black edges and a black loop. Um, I'll explain the coloring in in a little in a couple of minutes. Um, on I think the next slide. Okay, so using this basis um which this key gave us, we can um we can use this basis to um we can view the endomorphism phi through this basis. Um, and this gives us um, a map of graphs. And this map takes, um, so it, we've, here we've got our black edges. And here we've got our, our red loops. And so, yeah, so basically this um, map of graphs corresponds precisely to um, to the endomorphism that I defined. Okay, but the um, this this map of graphs has got certain um, certain properties which are um, which are important, um, and it gives you a. It means that when we consider our monomorphism, we get certain nice things happening, um, and this um, this viewpoint of a map of graphs explains these nice things in a very nice way. Um, so there's two nice things I want to highlight. Um, so the first thing I, I should say is we always, so you take this, you take your monomorphism and you can you can construct this, this map of graphs in a systematic way. Um, and when you do this, you get red edges and, and black, um, sorry, red loops and black edges. So red, red always corresponds to a loop and blacks can correspond to, to anything. Um, so the red loops correspond to things called vertex roses. So they're a loop based at a vertex, but you can have lots of them at a single vertex. So this gives you gives you a rose. Um, and and then you get this this first thing here. It's I guess it's slightly complicated, but the point is that it's it's almost an automorphism. So if you think about alpha and beta, um, this is this is this looks like an automorphism. Alpha goes to beta and beta goes to alpha. It, it's it's an automorphism. Um, but this thing is not an automorphism. Gamma going to alpha is not an automorphism. But when you do phi enough times, it you'll every loop, every gamma gamma becomes a becomes an automorphism eventually because it will end up in one of the periodic components. And um, so these things are are periodic. So the periodic and um, vertex roses. Um, it becomes what's called a base homotopy equivalence. Basically, it acts like an automorphism on the periodic uh, vertex roses. So this gives you, so this means that your red, red loops are sort of islands of stability. The black edges are different. They're, uh, they always expand. So it's called an expansion. Um, and they expand because images of black edges contain at least one, uh, sorry, more than one black edge. 
So here, um, M contains two. The image of U contains three. The image of R contains three. And the image of L also contains three. So you're always growing. Um, that every time you, um, when you apply phi to your map of graphs, these black edges expand. So this means that your, your, um, your graph has these red islands of stability, but they're getting further and further and further apart every time you apply um, the map of graphs to it. Um, yeah, okay, so that's this is called an automorphic expansion. Um, and um, I mentioned that they were introduced by Mutanguha, so I should mention a couple of results of Mutanguha um, in this setting. So um, the first result is that um, these are canonical. So if you start with a, um, with a monomorphism, these automorphic expansions are canonical and you can also compute them. Um, so they're canonical and you can compute them. Um, so this is, yeah, 2021 and 2022. These are very, very recent results. Um, the second result um, follows from this, um, from this theorem. Um, and it's, this is the equivalent of the, this is the bogopolsky masakova result. So this is entirely equivalent to the bogopolsky masakova result. Um, and in fact, the proof uses the bogopolsky masakova theorem. Um, but let me just at least wave my hands at, at the proof of it. Um, so if I go back to the previous slide. So in this example, um, so if delta is contained in fix of phi, then delta um, corresponds um, to a loop um, based, uh, let's just write here. So a loop based at the central vertex there. But any loop base of the central vertex must contain a black edge. However, we know that black edges expand, but your loop has got fixed length. And um, so if your loop has got length three, say, then by the time I've applied phi three times, um, your loop can't be in, in, in that image. It can't be based at that loop. So, um, so if I, um, so let's say, however, um, no loop based um, here um, can be in phi to the n, or let's say image of phi to the n. Of phi to the n for all n, and this is by by this expansion property. Okay, because you're expanding, your loop has got fixed length, but that's not allowed. Um, so that so that means in this specific example, our fixed subgroup must be trivial. Um, the the full proof is using the same subgroup that we talked about earlier, the stable image, and it's reducing it to the, the bogopolsky maslakova result. So it's got the same structure as, as the Emmerich and Turner theorem before, where you were taking the stable image and applying a result about automorphisms to it, but you're doing it in a slightly more um, topological way, and um, a slightly more involved way. Um, okay, um, so now I want to talk about um, about groups. Um, so what we've got, um, what I've talked about so far is that if you've got a monomorphism, a problem about monomorphisms, you can reduce it to a problem about automorphisms. And these automorphic expansions, this topological viewpoint of Mutanguha allows you to do this in a, in a very systematic way. So we're going to use this, this viewpoint, this sort of, this compass, um, this pathway to attack the problem the problem that I care about. And so the problem I care about is something called the conjugate problem. And um, so the world of group theory, which I come from, is um, is called geometric and combinatorial group theory. And 
and this comes out of topology. It really emerged at the start of the of the twentieth century, um, and the topologists were um, thinking about groups as fundamental groups, and here um, presentations were the way that groups were given to them. Um, so this is what's called a group presentation, and topologists encountered groups naturally in terms of presentations. And you can ask how good a presentation is at the description of your group. So Max then, at the start of the 20th century, asked three problems. The word problem, the conjugacy problem, and the isomorphism problem. And these were all about understanding how good presentations are and describing groups. And we know that all of these, these problems are all algorithmic in nature, and we know that they're all undecidable. Um, but you can still ask them for specific classes of groups. So the, okay, so I care about the conjugate problem. So this is about if you're given two groups and uh, sorry, two elements of your group in terms of this presentation, can we determine if they define conjugate elements of your group? So you should just be thinking, given a pair of elements, do I know if they're conjugate or not? Can I algorithmically determine this? And so that's the, that's the problem that I want to answer. Um, so, and the class of groups we're going to think about and um, that we're going to answer for are these things called ascending H and extensions. Um, so here, remember I said that we've got um, our free group F and then we're defining a new group in terms of, of this monomorphism phi. Um, this looks very much like your free group semi-direct product Z. But it's not this in general because phi is not an optomorphism, it's an injective endomorphism. Um, it's definitely helpful to draw parallels between um, between these semi-direct products and these ascending H and extensions, and that's what we're going to do in a minute. Um, but you should um, some or the main the main result here though is that this um, this subgroup embeds. Um, so we've got a free group and we're building on top of it using this endomorphism. And it is really building on top of it because this free group embeds. Okay, and then and then we get this the special case that I just mentioned. Um, it's a free bicyclic group um, if, if phi is an optomorphism. And then this gives us a um, this gives us a semi-direct product. Um, okay, so our plan um, is to um, so our plan is to um, is to start by free, start by considering free bicyclic groups, which really correspond to automorphisms, and then using this to understand ascending. HNNs. And we're going to be using the results that we've talked about before and um, using these results, which were about automorphisms and extending them to endomorphisms, to monomorphisms. Okay, so if our pathway is about free bicyclic groups and extending ideas there to ascending HN extensions, we hope that the conjugacy problem is decidable in this setting. And it is. Um, so that's good. The proof here has, has got two main ingredients. And um, the first one is due to Bogopolsky Masakova. This is the theorem that I mentioned at the very start, this algorithmic version of the of the Bethvina Handel theorem. Um, so and we know that there's a um let's say there's a monomorphism analog. Um, and this is due to Mutanguha. Okay, so key ingredient one, we know that there's, there's an analog for monomorphisms, and um, so we can put a, we can put a tick here. Um, but the proof is is recent and it's complicated using these automorphic expansions. Our second key ingredient I haven't mentioned before, and um, this is due to Brinkman, and it's about if I've got a pair of elements. U and V in your free group, um, 
and an automorphism, then we can determine if if phi to the p of u is conjugate to v. Um, so this symbol here means conjugate to. So we can determine if when we apply phi to u enough times, we end up with something conjugate to v. Um, so we want to then, um, we want to translate our second ingredient into a problem about um, about mono, um, about monomorphisms, um, but we should be wary here because we've got um, p contained in z, but that doesn't make sense for a monomorphism. You can't have um, you can't have a negative power for a monomorphism, and um, so yeah, so this is um, these are the uh, this is our appropriate analog. Of um of the problem here. Okay, so this is um these are the results that I wanted to mention. So we've got firstly that the conjugacy problem is decidable for this class of groups defined using monomorphisms. Um, I've talked about ingredient one. We know that that um we've talked about that already. Our second ingredient is this analog of the Brinkman theorem. And um, here we've got PQ are greater than or equal to zero. So they're natural numbers rather than integers. Um, but you should, um, and this um, phi to the p of u is conjugate to phi to the q of v. Um, this really corresponds to, you know, phi to the p minus q of u is conjugate to, um, is conjugate to v if phi is an automorphism. So it really corresponds precisely to this and um, this result of, of Brinkman and um, on the previous slide in the case of automorphisms. Um, and the proof follows this framework of Mutanguha by um, reducing it to a problem about automorphisms. It, you, we, uh, the proof uses these automorphic expansions to reduce it to a problem about, um, to reduce it to the, the Brinkman problem. And um, yeah, okay, that's all I've, I've got to say. Um, so thank you.